Morning, everyone. Today is Thursday, March 26, 2015, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week I think I make it. I make it. Think I mean it with the um, current uh, situation in the market unfolding, and I guess there's always a situation unfolding. And uh, we just have a lot to cover, so I'm going to get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew do not compensate me for this endorsement, but PepsiCo, hey, if you're out there, do me a favor, throw me a bone. Hey, you like it, the juice? The juice is good. Today's week of charts, or this week's week of charts, I should say, is brought to you by FinancialJuice.com. You can follow me there, FinancialJuice.com slash Dave Landry. Not a whole lot going on with me there that you won't be able to find on my website at the present time. But uh, there's some things that are in the works, and if I ever get caught up with some of this behind-the-scenes things that I'm working on, uh, upgrading the website and such, and all the subscription uh, products and all, uh, you will see me there soon. So hopefully I'll get all that knocked out. There's a disclaimer screen. I can sum it up pretty quick. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, do me a favor. Throw me a bone. You read the book. You like the book. Put me up a review on Amazon. Dot com. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but the uh, reason I ask is there's some malignant people out there that review the reviews, and I can't imagine having that much time to where you could review a book review. I guess you have you don't have enough time to read the book, but you can review the review. And I do actively solicit book reviews because a lot of people email me, but they won't put up a book review. Anyway, enough of that. Um, we had a little market spill yesterday. As you know, and it may not be over with yet, and it made me really think about the beauty of the trend knockout and how much I really love the pattern. And as you'll see in a few minutes, it's especially powerful if you combine it with a couple of other of my patterns, and we'll get into that in just one second. I got a question about one of my setups, or actually two of my setups for the service today. So I want to talk about stock selection, and what I did was I borrowed some stocks from my um not stocks, but some slides from a stock selection course. And it got me thinking, hey, let's try out that new special offer promo thing to see if it works. And um, it does. So more on that in just a little while. I've got a few email questions, as I just think I mentioned, and we'll get on that. So uh, anything you want me to cover, I think we should have time this week, but you never know what my rants. Uh, but if there's anything that you want me to touch upon, uh, let me know during the slides. And then... Um, Hold off with your stock uh, questions, individual stock questions, until we get to the actual charts. And when we do get to the actual charts, just uh, just type in one stock at a time, if you don't mind. That way I can answer your question and then delete the uh, question. If you ask about 10, um, I'll just pick one of the 10 and talk about it. You could ask about 10, but just hit return every time you ask about stock. All right. Last week I didn't have enough time to get into this too much because we had a really uh, we really slammed our schedule. But I've been thinking about it. And I've been asked recently about some tips and tricks to overcome the psychological demons of trading. I hate to call them demons, but there are some psychological issues that we do have to deal with as traders. And what I've learned to do is there's a lot of, a lot of little tips and tricks, uh, Douglas who wrote The Disciplined Trader. I think he also wrote, um, I forget his second book. It might be Trading in the Zone. If that's someone else's, I apologize. I forget the name of his second book. But I like the first book better. Uh, he was the first guy that really wrote a lot about uh, trading psychology. I mean, unless you go back to like a Jesse Livermore book written in the 20s and 30s. But as far as more modern, classic, uh, it's, a, it's a good book. And I remember it not being written as well as the second one uh, as far as, like, uh, structure and grammar and such. But it just was a good book, and it hit home with me. And I, I probably read it in the, in the early 90s, and it was a good time for me to read such a book when I was kind of searching a little bit and had uh, sporadic success. I'd do really well, and then, of course, the market would turn or something, and I thought it was me and didn't realize that sometimes it's just the markets. But anyway... Uh, read The Disciplined Trader if you get a chance. Read his other book, too. But uh, I, for me, it seems like all the old, old-timers, old I hate to say I'm an old-timer, but I guess I am now, all the old-timers tend to agree with me that the first book was better. 
people who are a little bit newer to trading uh, tend to uh, gravitate towards the second one. But anyway, a little um, little plug for Mr. Um, Douglas. I don't think I'm I'm not going to make any money off of that uh, unless you buy it through my website and I might make thirty five cents, which I'll be happy to throw in the plate. Um, anyway, one of the things that Douglas talked about is seeing things as happening and not happening to you. So that's one of the tricks. As I've said before, I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader because once you put real money on the line, things get a lot different. You start equating that loss to a week's groceries or a month's worth of um, a rent or a mortgage or something like that. A month's, I guess a month's worth of beer. <laughs> Um, so that that makes it uh, it makes it more difficult when you begin to monetize those things. So one thing that I do, and I think I learned this from Douglas, and I'll give him credit because he's helped me more than anyone in this industry when it comes to psychology, other than some people that I worked one on one with early in my career. But as far as books are concerned, I think that helped me the most. So again, plug for Mr. Douglas. Uh, but there's some games you can play. Like, for instance, you see things as happening and not happening to you. Like Mike Tyson once said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And so it's a little bit harder to to act at when you're, when you're getting punched in the face. But one thing that I do is see things as happening and not happening to me. And as Douglas said, I knew I'm finally going to get around to what he said, he said, see things as a movie, and sometimes that's what I do. And I try to, instead of having a, an elation or some sort of uh, aggravation, I, I try to say, oh, that's interesting. And if you choose your terminology carefully, then, then it can help tremendously. Um, I play a lot of little games with myself in life in general. Uh, for instance, let's say I, I go to the house and I, there's no clean dishes and I go to open the dishwasher and it makes that dreaded kablack sound, which means that the dishes are clean, but they're all in the dishwasher. And I'm like, well, I can unload it and my wife will be happy, but I don't feel like unloading a dishwasher. So I'll play a stupid little game like, you know what, I'm going to unload one cup and put it in a cabinet and one cup or one glass for me. And before you know it, I end up unloading the whole dishwasher. If I go home and things are kind of trash, and my wife is out and about, and it's like, you know what, I don't really feel like cleaning this kitchen, but let me just clean for 30 seconds, and I'll set a timer for 30 seconds. And 30 seconds later, I'm like, well, I got a lot done. Well, let's see what I can do in five minutes. And before you know it, five minutes, I've got everything eh, decent shape, decent enough to not get um, fussed at. So just I play a lot of little games like that. If I'm working on uh, a recalcitrant boat or something, and I'm bent, bent into some awkward position trying to get something loose, working on a car or something, I'll, I'll say, okay, well, I can, I can stand this for at least 10 more seconds, so I'll count from 10 to 0. There's little things like that, that I, just little goofy things, and you could do a lot of those things in the markets. For instance, just say, well, I'm going to follow my plan just on this one trade. I don't care, all these other stuff, I'm just going to let, I'm just going to continue to do the stupid things I've been doing forever. But on this one trade, just this one trade, I'm going to follow my plan exactly and see what happens. And before you know it, that one trade becomes two trades and so on and so forth. So I do play a lot of these little games when asked about what are some of the psychological tips and tricks. And, and that's some of the things I do. And what's got me on this rant is that the sometimes when I get stopped out, uh, I used to get really pissed off when I get stopped out, and I still get pissed off, but now I kind of feel like, you know what, like we talked about last week, I've gotten rid of a bad stock. I've purged that stock out of my portfolio. Like I said once when somebody's like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, ah, I'm in a bunch of bad stocks. Let's sell them and buy some good ones, and it's like, that's true. So if you're getting stopped out, then so be it. And a lot of times I'll just be just goofy with it, and I know it sounds a little bizarre, but Try this next time you get stopped out, and, and like I said, next week, you just kind of clench your jaw and uh, be very stern and with that British accent say, I say good day, sir, and, and be gone with it and be done with it. And again, like we talked about last week, 
if you allow that portfolio to be purged out, you'll get rid of the losing trades, and all you'll be left with is the winning trades. So just kind of make it a goal, play some games, do whatever you want, but follow that plan and let it unfold. And like I, I showed last week, had we kept all the losers that we had over the last six months or so, then we would be in the negative column for the last six months. Instead of, I'm not saying we're printing money, but we're nicely in the plus column, knock on wood so far for the last six months or so. But again, had we hold, held on to those losers, we would have a fairly substantial loss. So you have to do whatever you have to do. Do what works for, for you. Um, you know, just little things like, okay, well, I need, to, I need to go exercise. I don't feel like going to exercise. Well, I could certainly walk from my office to the end of the driveway, which is, about, which is about a tenth of a mile from where I'm standing. So I could do that. Okay, well, and by the time I do that, well, I could maybe walk to the end of the street, which is another uh, three-quarters of a mile or half a mile, whatever the case may be. And before you know it, I'm, I'm walking a few miles. So we just have to play these little games. And it might sound bizarre to you because these are little, little tips and tricks that I use, but you make them your own and do little things on your own to follow your plan. So anyway... That's a little bit left over from last week. The question is, what's the difference between swing trading and trend following? Nothing. Nothing. All successful trades must capture a trend. Let's take a look at that, okay? If you buy a stock here, oops, let's start over. If you buy a stock here and you sell a stock here, that is a successful trade. Or if you sell short, if you sell short here and you cover, which is also known as a buy, then from here to here, is a trend so you must capture a trend now a swing trade in my form is you're trying to capture that swing from the pullback back to the old highs or maybe a little bit beyond somewhere up in there you capture you try to capture a short term move of let's say uh, two days to maybe five days and sometimes just a little bit more to try to get that little pop back up. We're playing that reversion to the mead move, okay, but we're playing it in the direction of the trend, okay, so in other words, we're playing a pullback. Now, you're not going to get rich just making this much on a trade, but the good news is you're only risking this much, so you will stay in the game for a while. But rather than just make this much, like I preach over and over again, and risk this much, why not risk this much and possibly make this much okay and that's how it works longer term trend following is where the real money is but if you just try to trend follow, follow longer term you're going to be right about 23 to 27 28 percent of the time and that's um that's probably in good conditions in really good conditions you'd be right even more but in bad conditions you'd be right even less But if you are swing trading and keeping a piece of that position, I can't give you exact figures because markets don't adhere to statistics. But you're going to be right probably at least 50% of the time or thereabouts. In really good conditions, probably 70% or 80% of the time. And in, in fantastic conditions, maybe even more. But... As I often preach, I don't want to digress too far. Don't worry too much about your percent correct. Worry about your account value. Is it going up or is it going down? And are you capturing a few of these bigger picture, longer term moves? So I'm a swing trader, or I should say I'm a trend follower, which starts out as a swing trade. So swing trading, my style, is trend following. Now, other people might do reversions of the mean trading. And I'm just not a big fan of that unless you're doing it in the direction of the trend. In other words, trading pullbacks. 
Uh, like I said this morning, I got a little philosophical last night and just woke up kind of uh, same mood this morning, thinking about TKOs. And I love my TKO patterns, but not psycho. Phil says they're not psycho. She's talking about psychology, but not psycho. Um. Anyway, I was thinking about the TKO. It's a very simple, but it can be quite effective pattern. And to those of you who don't know what it is, let me just show you real quick. You're looking for a market that's trending and has a knockout move, but then you're looking to get on board when that trend continue, continues. So you're looking at a, for a market like this. You want to see a very sharp, ideally, knockout move, and then with that trend or if that trend begins to resume, you're looking to continue. Now, we'll talk a lot more about it in just a second, but that's the basics of the pattern, so you know what I'm talking about. If you if you ever think about technical analysis, and I'm not talking about some weird crap out there, some arcane trading system or counting of a wave or Fibonacci uh, <laughs> or something along those lines. Um, I'm talking about just looking at the charts and using the charts to read the emotions of the others. And I love what Tom McClellan said is that when you when you buy a stock, you're forming a relationship with the company. And just a short, just to kind of give you the, the quick Reader's Digest thumbnail on that. But you're also forming a relationship with everyone else who has bought that stock. And those people will screw you, okay? And if you watch these shows, you've seen me quote Tom before, and his mother Marion says, everyone uses, um, or, or has said, she's, um, she's no longer with us, but she said that everyone uses timing in their investment. Some people buy when they have money. Some people sell when they need money, and others use more sophisticated methods. So you got to realize you're dealing with all the emotions of the others while trying to control your own emotions, as I just said previously. So the beauty of the TKO is it's one of the patterns that you could really wrap your head around as capitalizing on the emotions of other players. So what happens is when the market is trending and it begins to sell off and makes a little knockout, type of move. You're dealing with the eager shorts and also put the ego of the shorts. Shorts for some reason they just love to fight trends, okay? So markets way up here, oh it's gonna sell off and then it goes higher and higher and higher. In fact, one of the things one of the old Wall Street adages is trends fight as long trends exist, excuse me, as long as people fight them. And if everybody agrees on price, then uh, there is no more trend. Who is left to buy? Okay. So the shorts tend to like to pick tops. They tend to, they want to be right. They they tend to worry more about their ego than making money. As a general statement, okay. You also have when a market sells off, you have some nervous longs. So let's say a market is trending, 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 and people want to get in. Oh, I want to get in. I want to get in. I want to get in. It keeps going, keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. Finally, you know what? I can't take it anymore. Let me go ahead and get in. So they get it right here. Then what happens? Bam. Market sells off hard shortly thereafter. So these Johnny come lately, these nervous Nellies, these people who buy very late in the trend, they get knocked out. And like the aforementioned quote from Tom McClellan, these are the people or some of the people that will screw you, okay? Because they didn't use proper timing in their buying. Or even if they did, they didn't follow, they didn't stick with it. They they bailed out the first signs of adversity. So that that's what will happen with these people who are the nervous dallies, the fast buddy, the so-called fast buddy. They tend to sell out. Then you got some eager shorts that come in too, okay? But if this market turns around and takes out that high, then do you have the predicament of these two traders. These people, they have to put up or shut up. They have to buy back in or risk being left behind. And these people, the shorts over here, they're at a loss. So they have to buy back their stock or cover. They have to close their position. Or risk being at an even bigger loss, and if it goes up higher and higher, 
then they might even be buying way up here. So maybe that will help to propel that longer term trend along. Okay. So the nervous longs, the fast money, those without staying power, people without a whole lot of money to trade. Or people without staying power. Maybe people that are over leveraged. Doesn't necessarily mean somebody with a small account. It could mean a hedge fund that's over leveraged. Uh, hedge fund gets some margin calls. Got to dump something. Okay. Uh, something happens with a fund. And they have a huge winner. Okay. And they decide, well, we better dump this winner before it turns into a loser. Or let's lock in that, let's lock in that quarterly performance because I want to pay myself and whoever else is in the hedge fund that 20%. We got a million dollars in the stock of profit. Let's just sell a boatload of shares and lock it in, and we're going to get paid $200,000 because we get 20% of all profits. So they're selling might not have anything to do with the fundamentals of the stock, with the technicals of the stock, or with for any reason whatsoever. So they might just dump the position, and you never know when they're going to do that because it's human nature. I don't know what I'm going to have for lunch today, okay? Uh, I know what I want to have, but I might change my mind between now and then. So... If you don't even know what you're going to do today exactly, how could you know exactly what everyone else in the market is going to do? And that's why you have to use a stop. So, again, the people without staying power, the people who are over leveraged, the shorts, the Johnny Cup lately, so those are all of the people that will screw you. Okay, But the beauty of the trend knockout is you let it unfold. And then you look to take action. And here's the other beauty. If it doesn't trigger, you avoid a losing trade. This is huge right here because market's going along, going along, going along. Bam, big knockout move. Okay. You get long here, you put a stop here. Well, many times I've seen a trade knockout. Next day, what does it do? It does that. Okay. No trade, no trigger, no trade. No harm done. No capital was put in harm's way. So that's one of the beauties of it. It also can be especially powerful when combined with persistency and acceleration. Okay. We'll get to that in a second. And it also can let you in the tread. By let you in the tread, it's amazing how many people email me with anxiety because they'll look at a sector and it's doing this. Dave, we got to get it. Dave, we got to get it. Dave, we got to get it. Well, be nice to be in because it's in a trend but you can't just jump in midstream unless you're running like I've said before unless you're running a relative strength based model and you're buying a hundred stocks at a time as an institution then then maybe yeah you can buy in midstream even if you didn't get in further back because if there's a hundred stocks like this and you're buying in midstream, buying at those new highs, then the chances are if enough of them take off and you get stopped out of a few, so what? But as a private trader, if you're just buying a couple of stocks in here, you can't just jump in midstream. You need some sort of setup. Okay. So it can let you add the trend. And by that, I mean, again, you've got a sector that's trending. And people get this anxiety because they're missing out. It's FOMO, okay? So trend looks like this. you got a lot of what they call fear of missing out. People just want to get in. And that's when they're, where those Johnny Come Latelys buy, like right here, and again, get in trouble. But the beauty of it is even this trend goes on and on and on and on, if you get a big knockout move like we saw yesterday, then they're going to let you in the trend. Two things are going to happen. The trend's going to continue. They're going to let you in, which is great because now you got your setup. Or two, it continues to implode and you miss the trade altogether, which is wonderful. And that's something I can't quantify for you. 
but it's huge because if you have a losing trade and then you have a winning trade, not only do you have to make up those losses, then you have to make up some gains on top of that in order to get back into black. And as you know, with the drawdown curve, the further you get into the red, the harder it is to get back into the black. If you lose 10% of, the money, of your money, he tried to say, you have to make back how much? 11.1%. Well, that's not too bad. But when you get down to about 50% of your money lost, now you got to make 100% of your portfolio. And that's not so easy. So avoiding those losing trades is really key. Now, again, it can let you in the trend. So let's say you got a stock that looks like this. This is my all-time favorite example. This was from about a year or two ago, 2013, 2014, uh, 2013. And this was on the cusp of being a little bit too extreme for a knockout move. I almost, I had to think about this one. And the reason I took this trade was because I looked at it and said, I like the way it recovered off its worst levels. So that told me that there was already some buying coming into this market, and maybe all the shakeout was, was, was done. And that's why, that was my thinking at the time. Um, what would it have, you know, I'm not sure we could talk at hypotheticals because somebody asked me a hypothetical we're going to look at it in just one second. Uh, it's kind of like Justice Pot Potter Stewart. I'll know it when I see it. Uh, if it closed out here, would I have still taken a trade? I don't know. Um, maybe because maybe because the chances of it triggering are probably slim and none, and then the next day we'll come in and the market does this, and we avoided a losing trade. So I would probably say with well, strong maybe if I'd have seen that, I probably would have taken it. But I do remember at the time, I liked the way it recovered, but not all the way. If it recovered all the way to right here, then, then I'm kind of faced with the dilemma. Uh, what if it just goes up a little bit more, comes back in? But right here, with it closing right here, it still had to go. It still had to follow through before I got my trigger in the trade. And that'll make a little bit more sense when we get to the, the question of the week in just one second. Now, the beauty of this setup is it has several things working for it. If you're familiar with my second book, I wrote about a pattern called Accelerating Momentum Strategy. And all that is, is you're looking for a market that's in a gradual uptrend that begins to accelerate, and then you're looking for a place to get on. My favorite pattern to get on would be the trend knockout. But sometimes you're going to pull back in a pattern like this. The beauty of the Accelerating Momentum Strategy is you've got a lot of buyers coming into the market here. Okay. And then, of course, you pull back whatever knocks them out, attracts the shorts. But if this thing takes off, sometimes the stocks will go parabolic, almost literally straight up. You do have to have a chair for when the music stops, and that's that's a whole other conversation. That's a big money management and position management conversation. That's why we take partial profits. The other thing that this setup had working for it was persistency. Now, persistency is a market's ability to go up day after day after day after day after day after day after day. It can go down day after day after day after day after day, too, but you usually don't get as much persistency on the downside because the downside tends to be more of a panic type of thing. Uh, there's an old Wall Street adage. There's only a few adages out there that are really true and worth thinking about. But one of them is that stocks take the escalator up and the elevator down. And if you dig around enough on YouTube, you could probably find a presentation where I talked about that. I think I actually had a video in my presentation on that um, of an escalator. <laughs> so they tend to kind of work their way up, and then, bam, they just implode like this. Now, if it just implodes in a minor way, we're looking to take advantage of that with TKO, obviously. But again, persistency. Mathematically, it's equivalent to linear regression. So notice that this stock, it was persisting back here a little bit. We were just trying to get started. And then it came back in a little bit, but not the end of the world. But then you had a nice little gap here, and then it consolidated, and then you had another gap here. So it's just kind of working its way higher. No setups in here whatsoever. But then notice that it began working its way higher, and then it began to persist day after day after day after day. And you could draw a trend line through most of the bars in here. Okay, So if you have a bunch of bars like this, Persistency would be 
a linear regression line drawn through the bars. Now I just draw an actual line. It is kind of fun, by the way, and this is something I play with quite a bit, to draw a bunch of uh, linear regression lines on a chart or have them plot automatically for you. And uh, it kind of looks like, uh, well, I think this is called like pickup sticks, and that's kind of a fun thing to do. I had a, at one point in time, one of my screens was programmed for that. When we get to the charts, we'll see if it's if I still have it. But that's kind of something fun to play with. But again, you know me, I like to just look at the chart and kind of eyeball it. I would actually draw this these lines in because I could see it, okay? But if you're a little bit newer to trading, then go ahead and draw them in when you're trying to determine whether or not a market is persisting or not. By the way, if you have a market that looks like this, that's how, let me just redraw that. It looks like this, that it's losing momentum, even though the net net is higher. And we'll get to that in one second. We'll get the stock selection. But anyway, we have, we have acceleration, number one. Number two, we have persistency. And number three, we've got the good old-fashioned TKO in this particular stock. So the combination of those three makes for quite a winning combination. And I've talked about this stock quite a bit. And you can see it triggers here, ran up a little bit, didn't do a whole lot for a while, gave us a dead money report. And then right here, we took partial profits, said that it didn't do a whole lot for a while. And then it began to work its way higher, not in a straight fashion, but well, decent enough. And then finally, we got the blow-off move right here. Now, sometimes you get this blow-off move like this, you'll get that right after the TKO. So this would be a little bit over. That's what we were looking for. But so what? It took us a little bit longer to get our money out of the trade. That's why earlier I was saying 2013, 14, because I do remember that we held this thing for a significant part of the year before we got our 153% out of the trade. Uh, but Dave, but what, it up like 200%? Yeah, it was up 211% right here. So what? We gave up a little bit, okay? You never get to 400% if you quit at 200%. You never get it to 800% if you quit at 400%. You're never going to make 1,600% if you quit at 800%, okay? So it's never enough. And that's a story that we talked about quite a bit. Dave didn't insert stock stock name here X Y Z. The reason I don't have it here because it's a live example. I don't want to add a courtesy to people in my service. Let's not uh, show that today. Uh, next week we'll uh, we'll pull this off and you'll see what it was. I know I'm such a tease. Didn't X Y Z pull back to the prior base of uh, four three four three uh, twelve? And regarding the stop on blank, uh, if the close of the TKO was at the top of the range, what would the stop and entry be? Thank you, James. Okay. Let's take a step back before we get to James's question, and we'll come back and revisit that one second. What his question got me thinking about was, let's go back and talk about stock selection for a little while. Now, you know me, I'm a pullback guy, so I like a trend and a pullback. And some people, when they see a chart that looks like this, they're seeing this. They're seeing this dotted line. And that looks pretty good. But what they're failing to see is that if you look at the price here in the pullback and you look at the price at point A, the stock has begun to lose some momentum. Okay. So if you're drawing that aforementioned trend line, it might look like that, and then it might look like this, as opposed to looking like this and like that, okay? One of the simplest things you could do, and if you watch my intro video, if you go to my website and you go to um, the intro video on stock selection, see if I could find that for you real quick, and you watch that video, you're going to see that in that video, I talked about net net change. So if you go to the store, I'll show you where to find it. And you click on how to pick the best stocks. And you scroll down on this page. There's a video down here on stock selection. So take a look at this video. And a lot of the concepts, a lot of the important concepts I touch base on here, obviously there's a lot more to it because, of course, it's 14 hours total. But it, it'll give you a good start. And one of the things that I'm pretty sure I mentioned in the video, if not, I should have, was never forget the importance of the debt, debt change. Is the stock higher, about the same, or lower than it was a week ago, a month ago, two months ago, and so on and so forth? And you'd be surprised how many stocks look pretty good 
like this, this dotted line. But when you look back in time, on a net-net basis, they really hadn't made much forward progress. So you could avoid a losing trades, a trade many times. You could avoid losing trades many times by keeping an eye on that net-net trade. So when I first saw this particular stock here from a while back, um, I remember thinking it's a pretty good-looking stock because you can see that it's had a really good run-up. Okay, let me see if I can draw it a little bit better. It had a really good run up, and then it pulled back. So it looks pretty good. But if you analyze it a little bit further, you look at where it is here, and you draw a line going backwards. This is a whole month, and this is about two weeks, okay, roughly, give or take a little bit. So you've got six weeks where this stock has not made any progress. So it still looks okay longer term. Don't get me wrong, but I tend to kind of look for perfection. I notice also that you did have a bit of a consolidation here, and it broke out of that consolidation and came right back in. So when I first see this stock, I do see this like everyone else. But upon further observation, I'm starting to see this. I'm also starting to see the base breakout and coming back into the base. So that's what James is talking about. James was in the stock selection webinar. He attended it live. And that's what he was talking about is that, hey, hey wait a minute. The stock you're, you're mentioning in the service hasn't it pulled back into that deal. And, again, this is where we drew it in, okay, so, again, you can see the difference. Also, you can see from this peak to this peak, you can see there's a little bit of a bend in the trend. Okay, so that tells me that this stock has lost some momentum. Here's a much more um, blatant, I guess for lack of a better word, example. Notice that. It's gone up 135%, so that's a pretty good trend from March to um, November or whatever. So if you see a little pullback in here, well, that looks pretty good. Wait a minute. we got one, two, let's just say a half, a little bit more than a half here, and almost uh, a half here. So a half and a half is what? A whole, so that's one, two, three. So now we've got three butts with the stock where it hasn't made any forward progress. Also notice this prior little peak in here. It just kind of peeps up. Then it comes right back in. And this actually turned into a pretty good short example for us. In fact, we shorted it, and we did okay. I don't think we, we uh, printed money, but if memory serves, it was a pretty good trade. If anybody's in here, it was on the service that they can let me know what um, we did percentage-wise. Um, I'd appreciate it. Uh, so... The other point that I wanted to make, and this is another slide straight from the, the webinar, the, the course I should say, is ideally you want to have a stock that um, runs up, pulls back, runs up, pull back. Or I also talked about box stocks. I don't have the slide in here for box stocks, but box stocks are kind of like Darvis style. They tend to do this, okay? Um, the bad news is my methodology doesn't necessarily – Get you, uh, well, no, take that back. I don't have a methodology based on this in and of itself, but if I see a little pullback along the way, sometimes we get into these stocks and they turn into box stocks. If we have time, we'll take a look at the open portfolio, and uh, let me make a note of that. And then we'll, uh, we'll see about, we'll, I'll show you how some of the stocks set up and then later turn into box stocks. But if you can find a box stock, meaning that it makes the box, and it starts making boxes on top of that box, that's a good stock too. But anyway, that's the kind of pattern you want to see, that sawtooth higher or a box stock, a box making boxes on top of boxes higher. You don't want to see a stock pull back to its prior pullback. For instance, you got a pullback here, stock takes off, and then it pulls back below its prior high, below its prior pullback, however you want to look at that, okay? And then obviously on our net net basis, you've lost some momentum. So that's a little stock selection one on one.
Dave, did blank pull back to the prior base regarding stop on blank? The close of TKO was at the top of the range. Would you? What would the stop and entry be? All right, let's take a look at the question here. His question is, did it pull back to the prior base of 3-4? Well, this really isn't a base in here, okay? This is just a little bit of consolidation. And now I know it's a judgment call, but if you look at the run from here to here, that's a pretty good run. It's not like it did this consolidated, broke out, and pulled back below that consolidation, okay? Now, let's say it broke out of this base here and had a pullback. That's a pattern I like, but if it broke out of the base and pulled all the way back in to this prior base, then I would avoid it. But you only had a few days' worth of trading. In fact, when you draw your lines, you probably, depends on how you draw them, you could probably pretty much intersect all the lines in here, and the ones that are outside are actually above. Okay, if you could do a persistency line like this, linear regression, and most of your, you intersect most of the bars, and the ones that you don't intersect are above, then you've got a pretty good trend in place, even though this, you could argue that it's a bit of a consolidation in here. But you can see that I could draw pretty much a straight line, and right here we got daylight above that linear regression line, and right here we got daylight above that linear regression line. So... I don't see this as a loss of momentum, and even if you didn't know anything, let's just draw a generic trend line below the lows, okay? So that's okay. This would be bad, okay? It would look like a double top, or even if it came up here a little bit, like we just showed in the example. So this is actually bad. This is good, though. So if you take a look at the stock to answer his question, did it pull back to the prior base? And the answer is no because there wasn't a base. This was just kind of a little consolidation in here. And again, just draw a trend line below below the lows in this case, and you can see that it didn't do it. Let's go back. Let's look at, like, some of these other examples in here. Yeah, well, notice, like, right here, let's say, let's say you were drawing a trend line below the lows. Well, it violated that and then just consolidated. So, and then it's also, well, you start drawing your new trend line, and you'd have some deceleration, okay? So, no, I still like the setup, even though it pulled back to that prior little bit of a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of a, I hate to even call it a consolidation, okay? And, yeah, I realize it could be a judgment call. Now, his second question was what to do with the entry on the TKO in this particular position. Now, before we get to that, we've got a question from Greg. Can a knockout bar consist of more than one bar? Can a knockout consist of more than one bar? The answer is yes, okay? Uh, one of my favorite trend knockout patterns is like that CLDX we just showed where you have the knockout first bar off the high. But notice in this particular case, we've got the high, and we've got one, two, three, four, and on day five, we get the knockout bar. So I think that's the question you're asking. Uh, can it consist of more than one bar? Well, that would be also, if your question is, is this also a knockout? Well, no, that's just going to be a generic pullback, okay? When you see that wide range bar down in a trend where you could simply draw that big blue arrow, in this case a red arrow, then it's a knockout bar. And the previous consolidation in February was about six days, about the same as March correction after February corex went much higher. I'm not sure what, what you're saying, Steve. The previous consolidation in February was about six days. Same as correction marked and went much higher. You're saying this consolidation here versus this one? Yeah, can you rephrase that question? Let me go ahead and delete this. I'm, I'm not sure what you're saying. That's why you liked March also. Oh, I liked it in March. Uh, was it on my Landry list? Yeah, but it didn't pull back enough, I don't think, back then, and that's why it wasn't an official setup. But, yeah, thank you. If it was, I appreciate you. I mean, that's good. I don't even remember being on the list, but thank you. Okay. So here you have this TKO. Now, James wants to know, hey, uh, you got your entry above the high, your stop below the low. What would happen if uh, it closed well? Okay. Well, if it closed well... 
and I still like the setup, my entry would probably be up here somewhere. The reason I like the setup was because the whole market got whacked yesterday, and so we could have a nice reversal in here today. And notice it closed on its butt. So if you get a TKO that closes on its butt, you could pretty much come in in textbook manner, especially at a wide range bar. And wide range bar is key, WRB, okay? You can put your entry up here, and you can put your stop down here. And that's kind of a no brainer That's easy. That's an easy pattern to teach, okay? Stop above the high, stop, uh, I'm sorry, entry above the high, stop below the low. The reason I some, sometimes say stop above the high is because you can, um, you could put in a stop buy order here. I don't want to get into that today. Uh, but if you read, may I have your order, please, in labor, they'll talk about that. So let's say you come in to today, the stock's down here, opens down up. It, it can open anywhere in here, doesn't matter. You can put in a buy order right here, a stop order, and then go about your life. Go walk around the block, okay? Do whatever you want. Spend some time with your loved ones. Go repair transmission or whatever you whatever you're good at. So where would my entry be if it closed well? Well, it would probably be a little higher up here just to avoid a possible false move. But I know that because this stock closed way down here, if it makes it all the way to here, I know it's not a false move. Okay? So that's why I would do that. Where would my stop be? I don't know. The stop would probably still be down here somewhere, but the entry would be a little higher. So it would be a, a bigger risk trade on a point basis and a percentage basis, but I would reduce my share size down so it would be the same uh, deal. Um, just real quick, I did revamp the store. I'm rebuilding all the back end of the website and upgraded the software, and the whole commerce system is being uh, redone. So this is what the store looks like now, and this is where the stock selection course is. And the reason I'm telling you that is because to you people who are here today seeing this, and only you people who are seeing this, and if you watch the recording on YouTube between now and Monday, okay, I'll give you $300 off of the course. Use WIC, and this is a zero, 326. Today is March 26th, okay? So WIC, we can charge March 26th, all lowercase. Very important to put it at exactly as it is. Computers can only recognize an exact thing uh, on that. So $300 off of the course. And the course is right there. If you go to DaveLandry.com slash store or from my website homepage, just click on the store icon. So everybody here, $300 off. Uh, before we hop into the chart, just real briefly, I'm still seeing a bull market at IPOs, but I guess bull market, I use this term kind of loosely. I guess if you count the amount of stocks that are going down versus going up, maybe there's not a bull market, but the beauty is the demarcation of the down stocks to the up stocks has been really cool, okay? There's a lot of them that are going down, just don't buy them, but there's also quite a few that are going up. And I'm still seeing the fly to die happen. And the fly to die means that these stocks just take off, these IPOs, and then they come back in and die. But a little money management will help you capture the crux of that deal. So see the IPO course for more on that. And again, the demarcation has increased. They're either flying or they're dying, and that's a good thing. It, it's the Will Rogers trade, as I say. You want to buy stocks that are going up, they're not going up, don't buy them. And there's been quite a few IPOs lately that have crash. So maybe I need to, uh, maybe I'm using that bull market term a little loose, loosely. Um, last couple of weeks, two weeks ago, market was getting low iffy, and then we, we started rallying again, it was looking better. Then obviously, we're kind of back into the soup again, we're back into that iffy part. So just remember, when things get iffy, follow the plan. I'll probably leave that in here for the next few weeks. Okay, uh, a couple of announcements. And then we'll hop into the charts. If you guys want to start asking about stocks now, feel free to do so. Uh, as I just mentioned, I revamped the store, and I've got a new e-commerce system in place. Uh, you don't have to call me. You can still call me, but you don't have to call me or a fax credit card anymore. Everything is, is done behind the scenes, and there's, a, um, what do you call that, all the encryption and all is there, so it's very secure. 
If you do go to the store, there is a I do have free reports section there. Right now, I've got a 21 page report on the methodology, and I'd say the the at least the theory and the practice, some of the practice behind the methodology, is there. Uh, obviously, there's some details, but if you read the 21 page report, you have a pretty good idea about my style of trading. Uh, with the IPO course or any course that I do for that matter, it comes with unlimited lifetime support. So if you take the IPO course and you got a question about IPO, you can email or call me and I will help you to answer that question. Now keep in mind, I might tell you go back and rewatch the course. I'll give you the answer, but I'll make you go back and rewatch the course. So be prepared to do a little work. Um, as I often say, it doesn't mean you call me up and say, I've got a trading system. Can you help me develop it? That's a different type of consulting. It's probably something that I wouldn't even take on. It's just simply not enough time, hours in a day to even think about something like that. But if it relates to the course, I'll be more than happy to help you out on that because I like seeing everyone succeed. By the way, um, I don't advertise this. I probably should. But if I do a course, as you know, I do some follow-up courses to it. And uh, I might do some follow-up courses soon to my IPO course and possibly stock selection course eventually. So you can attend any follow-up courses free. Uh, one thing that I've been doing since I've been really doing a lot of research on the IPOs is there's a few little tweaks and things that I've learned since I've put the course out. So maybe next year or maybe this summer when things quiet down a little bit, I might do another course on IPOs. If you attended one of these courses, then you're, you're, you get to attend any other course on IPOs for free. Okay. So if I do another IPO course this summer, just uh, shoot me an email and say, hey, Dave, remember you said I could attend for free. I uh, provided you paid for the course to begin with, okay? Um, that's a whole other story, but you can attend it free. And again, once again, the, the, the code is WIC03264, $300 off the week of charts. Uh, I'm sorry, the stock selection course. All right, let's hop into the uh, charts, okay? Uh, give me a few minutes to talk, but keep keep those stock questions coming. Let's talk about the market for a few seconds. Oh, before we do, uh, we were talking about uh, box type of stocks. Here's one that we're long. Notice that it made a box, and then it came up here, and it made another box. And then you hate to use the word hope in this industry, but hopefully rinse and repeat. Here's another example of a box stock which is somewhat set up again. It's, it's kind of, well, it's kind of pulled back to its prior base, so I think I would pass on a new setup. But there's nothing wrong with staying long, okay? But you can see you've got a nice little trend back here, a nice little pullback. And what happened? It just kind of died and went sideways. That's okay. That's a great patience slash dead money report example. But it did take off, okay? And now it's making another box in here. So that's okay. Now, you don't want to buy in the box, okay? You want to buy when you have some sort of setup, and hopefully that happens before you get into the box. So that's what I mean by box stock. Let's take a look at the overall market, and I like to look at the macro first, and then we'll work out to the micro, and then we'll, um, we'll take a look at a couple of sectors, and then we'll hop into your questions. Uh, S&P 500. Major, major bummer yesterday. It began to implode. So it's a bit of a bummer, but it's not the end of the world. We did bump up against these old highs, or thereabout, and then yesterday it began to implode. So it does put us back into this range. And round numbers, let's say 2100, and um, I'm sorry, about 1975 and 2100. Okay, and that's the range. Uh, if you didn't know anything about markets, just draw a horizontal line going back in time, or you could even measure it and say, well, we go back to November to March, where we are now, and the market's going up 1%. Whoop de doo. Okay, it depends on which day you pick. It might even be down in here. Let's see if we can find a get a little higher. Okay, okay. So go back to end of November and now, and we're actually down a little bit. 
This is not a trend. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. So we wait as far as the S&P is concerned. And if it just stays in here chopping around, we'll probably see fewer and fewer setups. Now, keep in mind the S&P is not the be-all, end-all, but it is an index that's worth keeping an eye on. And we're back below the 50-day moving average. There's nothing magical about the 50, as I preach day in and day out. And I probably, I, I rarely plot it on the charts, except when the market gets a little questionable. I like to say, okay, Dave, where's the 50? One of the cool things about the 50 is daylight and any other moving average for that matter, and that's where the, the lows are greater than the moving average. And that can help, you keep, can help to keep you, he tried to say, on the right side of the market. Notice you had a nice little daylight in here, okay? And as long as you have daylight above a moving average, you can pick whatever moving average you want. Depends on your time frame, I suppose. Let's just throw in a 200 just for S&Gs. Okay, and let's look at the daylight there. Uh, we need to go, let's make it like a cyan or something. Okay. Now notice we just had a little kiss here, a little kiss here. And notice this daylight we had from 2013 all the way up. You had some pretty big spills in there. Not that you want to just trade off of this, but it can give you a reference as to where the market is, whether it's going up. Or down. Now, of course, these big spills in here would have taken you out of your longs. And you don't want to sit around and stay long when you see this market begin to implode like this. So don't get me wrong. But you can see that for the most part, you had daylight in this market for quite a long time. And you still have daylight. Now, one thing I'm just literally noticing as I'm doing this is, where's that? Where's the 200-day moving average? Well, it's right towards the bottom of the base, right around 2,000. Okay. So it's like the thermos keeping the hot things hot and the cold things cold. How do it? No, a lot of times, a lot of tentacles will come in the same place. Well, 2,000, big round number, 2,000, bottom of the range, 2,000, that's where the moving average is. So there's a lot of things that suggest support at 2,000. Now, let's get back to the micro. I kind of backed out a little bit too far. We are below the 50-day moving average, but that's not that big of a deal, and you can't buy and sell every time it crosses above or below. But again, if you watch for something like daylight, you get a good idea whether or not the market is trending or not and what side of the market you want to be on. But so far today, let's take a look at the spiders. Spiders, you get a true open. Um, and you can see that we gapped down lower this morning. We sold off a little bit. Oh, it's the end of the world. You know, I try to avoid news, but I get a little bit through osmosis. And I saw on Yahoo Finance, oh, correction, no, oh, sky's falling. Okay, so what's happened so far today? Looks like we're going to get into the plus column. We did have some nervous Nellies bail out in the open. I don't get me wrong. I don't want to run out and buy this market, but I wouldn't rush out and say the sky is falling just yet. And so far, we've come back up. Now, obviously, we go on to make new highs in the market, then the market is okay. One day at a time. Stick a look at NASDAQ. NASDAQ's a bit of a bummer. Because it did pull back to its prior base. And that's something we've been talking about quite a bit. It almost made it back. So I wouldn't rush out and buy this index. And keep in mind also that indexes could be a little choppy. If you're trading individual issues and ideally smaller cap, less efficient stocks or inefficient stocks, then you could get a little bit more perfection in your charting. A more efficient stock or an index will tend to be a little bit choppier, and it is hard to catch trends in an index. But you certainly have to pay attention to them and see what's going on in the market. But we did come down to the bottom of this recent little consolidation slash the top of its prior range, which is also about 4,800. And just for S&Gs, let's throw some moving averages in here. I'd be willing to bet, I don't know, I'd be willing to bet that the moving averages are going to come in somewhere around these um, things. Look, I did, I look, I drew this line first of the moving average. Look where it came in, right? That's a 200. Isn't that cool? I mean, that's just cool stuff. I'm just, I just love that, the way that these technicals sometimes come together. Let's take a look at the 50, just for SGs. Oh, lo and behold, where's the 50? Right here, okay? Came down, kissed the 50, okay? Hopefully it came down to kiss a goodbye. So, so far, so good. 
So let's not get too excited about the NASDAQ. I don't want to run out and buy it. You know, if you're bullish, you might want to pull your horns in a little bit. But uh, so far, market's hanging in there. So these top pickers, they, they tend to predict early and often. And eventually they get it right. But eventually it could be a long time. Now, the Russell two days ago, maybe I jinxed myself, but I would say this for quite a while. It's going to be hard to have a bear market as long as the Russell remains at or near new highs. And, of course, what happens? <laughs> Laugh to keep from crying. We got whacked in the Russell yesterday. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't at a trend like this, and then the whacking came along, which would be a trend knockout. And it is kind of a trend knockout, but it's not the best trend in the world. Okay. It doesn't look like some of those stocks we saw earlier. And the trend knockout, like I preached a few minutes ago, brings you back below your prior breakout level. So it's not the greatest pattern in the world. But we're still above the 50-day moving average. We still have some daylight in here. And the 200-day moving average, where's the 200-day moving average? Lo and behold, right about the bottom of the prior range. Now, hopefully, you hate to use the word hope in this business, but hopefully we don't come all the way back in to the bottom of this range or into the prior range whatsoever. But we are kind of flirting thereabouts with the top of the range, which would also be, lo and behold, the 50 day moving average. So we need to keep an eye on that situation. Let's take a look at the dollar real quick before I forget. As I wrote in my last column, intermarket technical analysis only matters when it matters. Okay, So do read Murphy's book, and I have it here somewhere. It's called... Um, you know, my, my wife got so mad at me. Like three years ago, she, she arranged all my books. Oh, there it is, Intermarket Technical Analysis. And um, they're all messed up again because I actually occasionally pull the book off the shelf and read it. <laughs> she goes, I just, I just rearranged those. I'm like, yeah, it was like three years ago. She rearranged them by title. But anyway, it's, uh, I digress. Intermarket Technical Analysis by John Murphy. Uh, read it if you get a chance. There's plenty of copies floating around out there. You can pick up a used copy even. Um, for cheap, but um, use the link on my website if you want. Murphy explains a lot of things, which are good to know. Okay, for instance, if the dollar goes down, then commodities go up. That's a general statement. Okay, because commodities such as oil or dollar denominated. But keep in mind that it only matters when it matters. Okay, and even Murphy in his book says there could be long lead and lag times. So the dollar might crash long before a commodity crashes. Okay, I'm sorry, a dollar might crash long before a commodity takes off, or vice versa. But do read the book and know that it matters when it matters. And sometimes, for instance, the stock market will obsess over the dollar. It's funny, um, I try to avoid forums. Um, people tell you, oh, it's, a good, it's good to go into forums because it, it gives you some, some notoriety or whatever. But every time I've tried to go to a forum, this one particular forum, I absolutely hate. It's a bunch of haters in there. And every time I step into the forum, they just rip you a new one. And many of these people don't know their buttocks from a hole in the ground. Like one, because I was talking about if you did trade the S and P's, here's maybe you could use some bow ties, and here's a way to look at it, and, and here's a few tips and tricks. Not a big fan of trading the S and P's, not a big fan of day trading, but take a look at bow ties, especially if you're coming off a 20-day high or low. And so I put the little, I put my little two cents in there, knowing that what I was saying was conceptually correct and can work and does work. And they start ripping me a new one, and one guy comes in. Oh, all you have to do if the dollar goes up, you sell S and P futures, and if the dollar goes down, you buy S and P futures. Well, that poor guy, and I didn't have the. By this point, I was so pissed off at him. I was like, you know what? Have fun with yourselves, okay? <laughs> Go make love to yourself, okay? <laughs> but I did. I was like, you know what? Experience is the best teacher. Keep in mind that he identified a very small part of time where those those relationships work just perfectly. And a lot of the other time, they're not going to work. So, again, as I preach, 
understand these relationships, but don't try to trade them outright. So with that said, when this dollar begins to crash, we're probably going to see a major rally in areas like the energies, maybe even gold, okay? And let's take a look at the bow tie moving averages. As you can see, they're beginning to turn down, possibly could come together, could get across. As I say quite often, if all you did in efficient markets like the dollar, forex, uh, commodities, indices, anything that's efficient is trade bow ties off of all time or major, major highs, multi-year highs, and bow ties off of all time or major, major, major lows. I think you would do okay. And if you forgot about them the rest of the time, you'd do great and not. But you'd have to be a very patient type of trader. So whenever somebody says, Dave, I want to trade Forex, what should I do? That's what I tell them. Trade bow ties off of all time highs or major, major highs and or major, major lows or ideally all time lows. So we could get a significant move. When this dollar begins to crack from these high levels, this market could be a lot of trouble. So the point, let me just show you real quick. One of the most efficient markets in the world would obviously be bonds. Let's take a look at like a weekly chart. If you go way back to when bonds, uh, when did they top? Maybe I'm thinking about gold. Uh, maybe bonds. Years ago when they topped, we had like a, a bow tie or something. Yeah, right here. We had a bow tie off of all-time highs. Now, it wasn't a route lower, but that's efficient markets. That's what, what happens in efficient markets. We had a bow tie here, and then they lost. This is a huge move lower for bonds, okay? So this might be the ultimate top in bonds. We're kind of crawling back up a little bit. But you've got a first thrust down in bonds. So that my point is, if all you did was trade those all-time highs or major, major highs, transitional patterns in efficient markets, you'd probably do okay. Uh, gold's a good example of that, and somebody's talking about gold in the chat, so it'd be a good time to bring it up. Gold made like, made like a gatekeeper, and I've used this example. You see I've got it drawn in. And it never did get past that gatekeeper high. That was the ultimate high in gold, and that was in 2011, I guess, or 2000. Yeah, 2011. So that's what you want to pay attention to. So right now we've got a bow tie in the works or some sort of other emerging trend pattern in the dollar. So we're going to have to pay attention to that. And it's only going to matter when it matters. I mean, take a look at the energies, for instance, just by accident. We'll pull the energies. Notice what happened here. We had a bow tie off of major, major highs. And what's happened so far? Well, so far they had a pretty big implosion. Now, shorter term, since we're here, let's talk about it. But the dollar kind of coming in a little bit. Maybe that's why. Maybe not. Let's not get too excited with the correlation there. But it could be a double whammy as far as a rally in the energies. You can see that energies are kind of bottoming out here, Okay. We went after them recently. We failed miserably. So what? We get paid to put money in harm's way. Sometimes they work, and sometimes they don't. Uh, metals and mining kind of bottoming out in here. I certainly wouldn't rush out and buy them just yet. Gold stocks trying to bottom out a little bit. Looks like they might want to come back to the old lows. So what? Okay, we're just going to wait patiently for that to occur. Now, let's take a look at a few of these sectors in here real quick. Uh, yesterday's action is a bit of a bummer because these areas like, let's just say insurance, take insurance, came right back into their prior trading range. So that's something we need to pay attention to. And that's no big shocker because the market overall did that. Take a look at like real estate and some of these interest rate sensitive areas. They crawled back up towards their old highs like they don't care about interest rates. And then all of a sudden, as I say, it only matters when it matters, right? You look at that bonds versus some interest sensitive rate areas. Then the market begins to implode. This is real estate, and utilities have been in trouble lately too. They didn't make it back to or back to near their old highs, and now they're going to roll over once again. Okay, uh, utilities and real estate are highly leveraged areas, so they tend to go down when interest rates go up. Uh, drugs, so far so good in here. I'm a little leaning on an overall sector versus an individual stock. If this was an individual stock, I might not buy it because it did come back into its prior little breakout level, but as a general statement, so far, longer term uptrend remains attack. We've got a pretty serious correction, which happened mostly yesterday. So, so far, I think drugs are okay. Biotech looking a little dubious in here. Let's not get too excited just yet, but it does look a little dubious, and we do have a lot of support below where the market is now, so we might be okay on that. Um, I have stops in place on existing positions, and I have entries well above the market on potential new positions. So, if the market crashes, I avoid new positions. I can stop out of my old positions for what I call the better than a poke in the eye or so long 
and thanks for all the fish trade. Energy uh, transport score is a big, a major bummer. They were coming back in recently. They tried to run back to their old highs, and now they've come back in again. So they're stuck in a range. Some people get all excited about transports. I don't really worry about it too much. Computer hardware scores at a bummer as a bummer. Okay, it's over, it's already all the way back to the bottom of its range. Let's take a look at Apple Computer, which is pretty much a poster child for the entire computer hardware sector. It's actually up a little bit today, so that's a good thing. I wouldn't rush out and buy Apple. It's too efficient, but it is a pretty good bellwether to keep an eye on. And let's just take a look at the semis real quick. Let's take a look at retail first. Retail, so far, just pull it back. It's kind of losing a little momentum in here, so I'm a little concerned about that, but not the end of the world. And finally, let's take a look at the semiconductors, if I could find them. Semiconductors score is a major bummer because of yesterday's action. We had a minor double top in here. I would never sell a market just because it made a minor double top, and now it's begun to implode a little bit. Now I'm a little bit concerned about what's going on in the semis. Okay. All right, let's uh, open it up for individual stocks. John says GLD is moving up. Moving on up to the sky, to a D. Was it moving on up to a deluxe apartment in the sky? Well, we're moving on up. Yeah, but there's no pattern here yet to trade. Okay, it's just kind of bouncing off its old lows. But I hear you. JJC turning up. Do I have an organized list of all my setups? Yeah, um, you can get them not on all on one page, but you can get them from a store. Go to uh, you can get an ebook of uh, ten best right here, and you'll get it in about five minutes. No, two minutes, right there, ten best. Seventeen dollars. No, twenty-seven dollars. I lowered the price a little bit. Um, all right, let's take a look at some of these uh, questions in here. Okay, uh, Heather wants to know about NBIX. Take a look at that. Yeah, metals and mining, uh, somebody pointed out that JJC was moving. Metals and mining have, are kind of bottoming out, but I think it's going to be more of a process than an event. Yeah, my problem with, with NBIX, we talked about this one last week, is that it has lost momentum. See the line I've drawn in here? And, yeah, it's a TKO yesterday, and it might work. It might be okay, but it's given up a lot of trading in here. If anything, it looks like it's in trouble. It looks like a more of a first thrust down. I know there's a fine line there. Uh, sometimes a, a, a major, major TKO can turn into a first thrust. Okay, STLD. Shay, I don't remember. Or if you're on a service, just email me. I'll email you that book. You don't have to buy a copy. Uh, I'll give it to you. I, I think you're on a service. If not, um, don't lie to me. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this shade's kind of interesting. You do have some overhead supply here. It's a little wide and loose, but these metals and mining can be a little wide and loose. Probably got a bow tie working. Eh, it's okay. Um, I would avoid this stock just because it's got this overhead supply to deal with. It's a little wide and loose. Maybe if it was uh, coming off a of major, major, major lows, like if this was all-time lows and we didn't have this overhead supply, then it might be worth a shot. But I would avoid that one. Okay, Gary? All right, well, Andre, what you got? MVIS, MVIS. Yeah, it looks good. Um, let's see if we could pick it apart a little bit. Yeah, it's kind of an extreme move higher. It went up 100% over a few days, but I do like it. Um, it's kind of wide and loose if you look at the last couple of years. But if you back the stock, stock way out, it's what I call a Phoenix stock, okay? Uh, it might be reverse split, though. Let's just see something here. Show unadjusted for splits. Yeah, it looks like they might have reverse split this thing or something, but still, I'm going to give it an okay. Um, 
It looks okay. It's not jumping out at me as a fantastic stock because it was so wide and loose and all, but it looks like they're finally getting their act together. Somebody emailed me recently and said, Dave, how could this $1,200 stock be $1,500? It was $1,200 in 1990-something, and now it's, uh, now it's $15. And, well, maybe they did something wrong, obviously. <laughs> maybe their drugs didn't pan out. Maybe they were in the wrong industry at the wrong time. But a company can reinvent itself. And one of my one of my favorite patterns is like the solar stocks did in 2013. All these stocks sold off because it was the promise of the future, and people said, "Ah, eh, well, solar's not going to work." And then all of a sudden, into 2013, I don't know if energy prices were higher or whatever, probably were. But for some reason, solar was uh, back in the limelight, back in the light, so to speak. No pun intended. So companies can reinvent themselves. So this one looks okay. Uh, I think it's a, a dangerous setup, so tread lightly and be careful on that one. But I think it looks, uh, I think it looks okay. Uh, again, though, this is a pretty big move. It's about 100% uh, a very short period of time, so be super, super duper um, things. Uh, I'm on your stock selection course. Yeah, I'll send it to you then, Shay. No problem. Uh, shoot me an email, though. I'm, it, um, I have a bad memory. I, I work at, it's like I, I'm always, you know, my wife's like, did you do this? I'm like, send me an email. She used to hate that. And now it's like she whips out her phone. She sends me an email, and then I do it. That's my to-do list. So if you want something done, send me an email. Nice show, RGA. Let's take a look at RGA from Mr. Steve. RGA. Ah, uh, well, it just kind of. Barely peeped out of this little consolidation. Now it's kind of coming back in. Look at the HV on this, 16. What's the what's the spiders right now? About 18 maybe? 13. So you're right in line with the overall market. Um, close enough for government work. You're not going to beat the market as a general statement. And some people might argue this with me, but just trust me on it. You're not going to, how about you're not going to beat the pants off the market if that's your goal which I guess it should be to make your goal should be to make money. Don't worry about benchmarking. Benchmarking makes me nuts because nobody gets all excited. Nobody comes up to me and, and gets all excited and, and sings my praises when I have a positive year in a year like 2008. Okay. When the average mutual fund lost 50%, you know, so nobody gets too excited about that. But, if the market goes up 13, 14%, and we had a flat year, or things a little choppy, it's like they ride my ass. It's like, well, you know, what about 2008 <laughs> when you would have you'd have blown up, okay? And we actually made money, so the bitch market could be pretty tough to um, to deal with, unless you have uh, if, unless you have a year where you have a solid trend, and then you you beat that solid trend even more through inefficient stocks, but. As a general statement, you're not going to beat the market with uh, stocks at the same volatility as the market. So I'd pass on that one. Uh, TSRO for Heather. Um, it's losing momentum, okay? You see it kind of took off in here, and now it's kind of doing this. So it looks like a stock that's losing momentum. Here's the thing. I mean, you go back and look at, uh, I think one of these was a drug stock in here. You look at these drug stocks, okay? Look at the one that was a TKO for today. I could find it. That's a drug stock. I mean, this thing is going, is that it? Yeah, I think it is. It's going straight up, okay? That's the kind of momentum you want. You don't want a stock that's losing momentum like this, okay? So be careful with that one. In fact, I would pay. In fact, look, that debt, you can go back quite a ways. It kind of looks like that little example I used earlier. Sorry I missed what you said about STLD, okay? You, would you ask a question go to the bathroom? <laughs> uh, I would pass. you got some overhead supply in here. And you could, uh, I'll have the show up on YouTube in about, uh, about, about an hour after the show, once it gets through processing, so you can watch it again. I, I talked about a little bit more. SWKS for Steve. Uh, yeah, this is kind of interesting. This was actually on my list yesterday. Coming into today is a nice little knockout type of move. I certainly can't fault it. It certainly persisted, and then look what happens in more recent times. It's begun to take off. Um, I would only enter this if it came way up here. The only problem is it's, it's so close to the old highs. You're kind of buying at the high. Uh, 
So I think as a general statement, it looks pretty good. My only concern, like I talked a little bit about last week and, and occasionally, with these stocks that are up three and four hundred percent over the last several years, you have to wonder whether or not they're priced for perfection. Not that I would never buy them, but you have to wonder if they've been around so long. And then notice the volume on this stock is pretty high. Four million shares on average trading. So it's a pretty thick stock. It's probably it's probably in a lot of institutional accounts. So one has to wonder if it's priced for perfection, and that by that I, I get so many questions on that, and that just means that they're expecting uh, continued greatness, and they're being put under a microscope. So take a look at Traders Magazine. I wrote an article on efficiency, and read that article, and that kind of dovetails in with the price for perfection thing. All right, you're welcome, Shay. No problem. SMH appears to be bouncing up to an day moving average. Let's take a look at that. Fat fingers today. 200. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating that um, this SMH was doing incredibly well, and then it, it just begins to implode down to its 200. There are a lot of people out there that really pay attention to when a market gets stretched away from its moving average, and that's kind of like longer-term mean reversion. In um, I wish it was a way for me to catalog who's who, but if you go in and watch, go to my YouTube channel. If you're on YouTube now after the show, look at my likes and click on the timing research, and you could uh, you could subscribe to that channel too. It's a good channel. I'm the host of the show over there, so if I say so myself, it's a good channel. But I learn a lot from those shows. And last week, uh, a gentleman was really talking about, uh, or week before, was talking about. The that were due for a big reversion to the mean to the longer term moving averages, and then I thought to myself, eh, I'm not going to worry about that. And here we are a week or two later, and <laughs> bam, it's like wow, it did. So maybe it does matter, <laughs> but it really only matters when it matters because notice that this market, for instance, went a long, long time without a pretty serious. I mean, you had a correction here, but you had a pretty you went what two years before you had a serious correction to the moving average. So I wouldn't worry about that too much for timing unless. That's something you've spent a lot of time studying, okay? I became poor. I mean because to poor guidance from SDK, SDK. I don't know what you mean. They had poor guidance or something? Something happened? I don't know. Um, are you confusing the issue with facts? State, go put down Yahoo Finance, okay? SLTD, SLTD, SLTD. SLTD? Are you kidding me? No. <laughs> this is a Nicholas Fine stock. SLTD? Are you kidding me, Gary? Gary, you do better than that. No. I I'm going to find Nicholas. That's it. Where's Nicholas? Nicholas, where are you? Here we go. Let's we bring it up, Nicholas. Don't make me dust off Nicholas. No. <laughs> Seriously? No. If I was allowed to curse in here, I, I, I would say that this was a piece of shit. I mean, come on. What the hell? <laughs> Look at all your resistance here. It, it, it took off. It came unglued. No. 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 A-N-L-Y on a pullback. And it says Heather left. She's, I guess she's in the other room. Heather! Let me holler so she can hear me. <laughs> no. No. Where's Nicholas? But Come on, you guys. No! Did you not hear a word? I just said, see, Heather's not here. Now we can pick on her. Oh, she came back. Oh, oops. Uh, never mind. <laughs> yeah, it broke out, but then it came all the way back to its base. Okay? And then go to your left. Somebody needs to watch the stock selection webinar. Oh, it says you left. Okay, uh, what else? SWKS is down on poor earnings. Ah, so what? What does that have to do with anything? Okay. A lot of Momo stock that got killed yesterday are finally supported at 50. IBB Biotech Index is one. Okay, Phil, let's take a look at that. Phil's a big fan of that 50-day moving average. So, 
as I said earlier, like if you're not going to you study some of these things like how far away we are from the 200-day moving average, but unless you make that a major part of your trading life, don't get too wrapped up in that because if you if you try to put on too many things, you end up with analysis paralysis. Instead, just keep it simple like I do. As a, That's my statement. Obviously, it's not my way or the highway, but in general, you want to keep it simple. And just look at where a stock is, where a stock was. Is it pulling back? Is it set up? Is it losing momentum or is it gaining uh, momentum? And and keep your life uh, that'll your life get a lot easier. So Phil saying that the uh, what do you call this? The SMH, the SIBIs, or is this the uh, oh biotech? It's pulling back to one cup of coffee next week, Dave, or one Mountain Dew. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, and looks like uh, you go back in history and. Uh, it's had some interesting pullbacks to the 50, and then it's taken off from there. Uh, will this be the last time? I don't know. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. But, yeah, good observation on that, Steve. I'm sorry, Phil. Do you think the futures tend to trend better? No, no, no. Read, uh, read the article in um, Traders Magazine this month. Futures are more efficient market. Okay. And breakouts have higher probabilities of succeeding. No, 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 because there's too many people watching the futures market. Okay? Futures also have a lot of diverse products that have lower correlation to each other. Uh, I don't know. Sometimes all the grains go the same way. Sometimes silver and metal go the same way. Sometimes silver, metal, and energy go the same way because the dollar is going down. And sometimes silver, metal, energy, copper, uh, what else? <laughs> and several other ones all go the same way because the dollar's going one way. So I wouldn't say that they're not correlated. Uh, maybe at times they're not, but uh, I spent 14 years as a commodity trading advisor, so I I learned a little bit during that time. BTX, John is long BTX. Well, John, I better like it. I'm I don't want to beat you up. No. <laughs> eh, it, it doesn't jump out at me as a good setup. Um, I don't know what you did. I'm not a breakout guy, except except in IPOs there are some specific breakout patterns. Okay, but no, I don't see anything to get too excited. You hit a wide range bar and then kind of pulling back. It's a little thin too, so I'm not sure what you're saying. I know you don't look at volume, but IBB battle taking place at on 400% plus volume. Yeah, I'm not a big volume fan because of derivatives and everything else. But I hear what you're saying. You're saying that uh, there's a big volume. Today, let's just for shits and giggles, let's put it in the. Uh, I'm sorry about my language, ladies. Um, volume bars. Here we go. I don't even know how to plot them. Did they come up? Shows you what little to know about volume. Here we go. Oh, put it in the bottom. Okay. All right. All right. So Phil says, yeah. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. You got a big volume sell off. Okay. But so what? Because that might be a good thing. That means that there's uh there's a lot of buyers. You know, you're like, oh well it's uh you know, four billion shares. That means people are selling. Yeah, but wouldn't two billion people be buying it too? So I'm like, hey, look at that, two billion people bought the IBB. I don't see it as two billion people sold the IBB. Okay, see what, see what I'm saying? Slippery slope with volume, slippery slope. If you want to make volume part of your analysis, then by all means, knock yourself out. It's not my way or the highway. I don't think you even have a sign. Let's see, my way. My way, highway? Here it is. There you go. It's not my way or the highway. I hear you, though. Today's volume is double the run rate of yesterday's. Yeah, well, that's a good thing, right? Because it means it's going back up. Short on NOC. All right. Uh, that looks okay. It's not bad. Yeah. John, you just redeemed yourself. That looks pretty good as a possible short, okay? Uh, you got a thrust down, a pullback. But I don't see any reason to rush out and start short this market just yet. Um, the, the, we had a price shock in the system. If the market was gradually rolling over and we had a bow tie in the S&P and the – rusty and the NASQAQ and all that, then I'd be a little bit more concerned about the market. But basically, we just had a bit of a price shock in the market. So follow-through is going to be key. If the market continues to slide, 
then I'm going to start getting worried about it. But right now, I don't see any rush. I don't see any reason to rush out and do any shorting just yet. That's weird. I'm calling myself. <laughs> the caller ID has my own number on it. Oh, tried to answer it. I was going to say, hello, David. It's David. <laughs> I, wonder how, I wonder what happened there. That's kind of interesting. Telemarketer must have uh, figured out a way. That's strange. Okay. Uh, one more, and then we have to shut things down in VIS. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we talked about this one earlier, uh, I think. Uh, no, yeah, we did. Uh, everything I said earlier on that one applies. Well, uh, it's interesting. Okay. Well, looks like, uh, yeah, I gave myself a margin call. Looks like we're out of time here. Uh, I appreciate all you guys coming and girls. Uh, as you can tell, I love doing these shows. I have a blast doing them. Uh, any unanswered questions, David, Dave, Landry.com. Everybody have a great rest of the day. If you have any questions, uh, again, DavidDaveLandry.com. And if not, I guess we'll see you next week. Uh, thank you so much.